Today we learn why Nvidia's new GPUs suck and RX 10,000 could really take the lead. Next gen desktop APUs, here we come, Nvidia explains their terrible decision and AMD's X3D chips could soon be challenged. Welcome everyone to Gamer Melt. But first, every time you don't subscribe to GamerMeld, a GPU gets priced $300 higher than it should be. Coincidence? Probably. But why take the risk? Stay ahead of the nonsense, get the real story behind the hype, and watch me roast absurd pricing like it's my full-time job. Because, well, it kind of is. So hit that subscribe button before prices go up yet again. Okay, it's news time and first up for today, a very interesting new report just dropped that actually compares the IPC of both Nvidia and AMD's current generation of GPUs to their last gen parts. And this is really interesting because IPC or instructions per cycle is usually a metric only shown with CPUs, but what it does is compare one architecture to another. They do this by using the same clocks on both parts, as well as the same amount of cores to eliminate those factors so the main difference is is the architecture. That's obviously difficult with GPUs given the broad range in core counts, different types of cores, as well as clocks. To get around this, Computer Base made some changes to align the ALU count and they compared a 5070 Ti with a 4070 Ti Super for Nvidia and a 9060 XT with a 7600 XT for AMD. And the results are very interesting. As you can see right here, when comparing Lovelace to Blackwell in pretty much every metric, it's essentially a wash. We're talking 99% to 100% with Blackwell winning here, but then over here, Lovelace wins, and then Blackwell wins here, but as you can see, once again, we're talking about a 1% percent difference. So this is exactly why it really feels like the RTX 5000 series was just a terrible upgrade. Now, obviously a lot of them do have more cores and things like that. So I mean, it does make sense. They have more cores, they have higher clocks and those do come into play. But when we're strictly comparing generation on generation, just purely the architecture, they're essentially the same. Now, with that said, don't forget AMD made some pretty big claims about their new architecture and well, it actually looks pretty good. You can see that it has a decent boost in rasterization, a bigger boost in ray tracing, and then a massive night and day performance increase in path tracing. Meaning AMD's new architecture is a very real jump over last gen, while Nvidia's not so much. And not only that, but don't forget that AMD's next gen, if these leaks are accurate, which of course this is from Kepler, who is someone who's been extremely accurate in the past. But don't forget that I recently went over the fact that he claims we're looking at around a 20-ish percent performance increase in raster performance per CU, meaning they could in fact do it yet again going from RDNA 4 to RDNA 5, or well, in this case, uDNA. But it actually gets even better because we're talking 2x increase for ray tracing slash AI performance. Now, like I said in that video, that isn't directly double the FPS or anything like that. It's a little bit more than that, but still, these are massive boosts, meaning, if AMD actually does in fact do this yet again, and especially if Nvidia has such a disappointing new architecture with their next gen GPUs, AMD could finally not only catch up, but potentially even finally beat them. And next up for today, if you remember not too long ago, I went over this leaked next generation architecture from AMD called Gorgon Point. It's basically a new generation for AMD's next gen notebook APUs, but there is something a little bit more interesting about this. I mean, it's more or less just like a small upgrade over current gen. Really, it seems just like a refresh over current gen. But there is something even cooler about it, but I'll get to that in just a second. Either way, as you can see right here, we have a shipping manifest that clearly shows some of these new, you can see FP8, FP10, and FP12 based Ryzen processors for notebooks. Specifically, the shipping manifest show 10 core and 12 core SKUs are coming. 
You can see them right down here, and yeah, that is pretty interesting, but the really big news is the fact that Gorgon Point also, at least according to rumors, is set to come with something else, specifically Ryzen 9000G desktop APUs. And don't forget that these bad boys have one very interesting new thing, specifically they've upgraded to upwards of 16 CUs. And hopefully this time around AMD delivers those. Either way, we also have our first benchmark for it. As you can see right down here, this is Furmark. It's not the greatest benchmark for comparing GPUs, but at 1440p, the iGPU scored 1097, which is around 1% higher than the Radeon 780M. And in 4K, it scored 542 points, which is roughly 5% lower than the Radeon 780M. Now, don't get too discouraged or anything like that. As they state in here, this is likely a lower in skew, but it definitely shows that these are likely coming. And that means a much faster APU to further push out discrete GPUs. And next up, while I already covered NVIDIA's newly announced RTX 5050 GPU, I only discussed the desktop variant, for obvious reasons, but there's one very interesting factor when it comes to the notebook version. Specifically, if you remember the RTX 5050, the desktop one, comes with GDDR6, but the notebook variant of all variants actually still comes with GDDR7. And believe it or not, NVIDIA actually kind of tried to explain why that is just recently. As you can see right down here, Hardware Canucks discussed this very odd fact, said the laptop 5050 GDDR7, desktop 5050 GDDR6, and said what's with GDDR6 on the desktop card? And to answer that, NVIDIA's head of global PR said this, the RTX 5050 Notebook GPU has been optimized for the best power efficiency for portable laptops with great battery life. Therefore, GDDR6 is the best choice for desktops and the more power efficient GDDR7 is the best choice for laptops. Now, this is clearly crap because GDDR7 isn't just more power efficient, it's more powerful. It's faster, it's better in pretty much every way. So he doesn't actually explain why GDDR6 is on the desktop card, he just explains why GDDR7 is on notebooks. And the obvious reason for that is to bring down the price. And honestly, that would be understandable if it weren't for the fact that the card is still $250, the same price as the two generational 3050, yet both cards have the exact same amount of cores. Now, don't get me wrong, the 5050 does have much higher clocks, it does have better technology in it and everything, but still, this is a massively disappointing GPU. And this response does not help at all. And lastly for today, as many of you know, leaks claim that Intel's next generation Nova Lake S is set to be some monster chips. I'm talking they get up to 52 cores. And we are talking consumer desktop parts here. But according to a new leak, Intel has something up their sleeve to even challenge AMD's X3D gaming CPUs. As you can see right down here, this leaker actually responded to that leak of the cores of the CPUs, and he asked BLLC question mark. Well, what that is, as you can see right here, it apparently refers to something known as Big Last Line Cache, and it's very similar to AMD's 3D V Cache. And as they state, we know for sure Intel has such a technology because it's incorporated in their new Clearwater Forest generation of Xeon server CPUs. But Intel has previously said that they have no immediate plans to bring that technology to the desktop. With that said, they've also sort of mentioned that it's not off the table either. Well, it looks Looks like it may in fact be coming because according to this leaker, well, it is coming and it's actually coming to a couple different chips. Specifically, it's coming to the one, the Zen 5, that comes with eight performance cores and 16 efficiency cores, as well as the one that comes with eight performance cores and 12 efficiency cores. And this actually makes a ton of sense because obviously when you have a CPU with 52 cores, games can't use anywhere near that amount of cores. 
So ultimately, that would probably be a hindrance to a chip specifically made for gaming anyway. It would be more expensive, and there's just no reason to do it. Hence why the 9800X 3D is way more popular than the higher-end SKUs. Though, obviously, that's for people who kind of want to do everything. But still, there's a reason AMD's first X3D product was the 5800X3D. Either way, as you can see here, he claims that it does in fact come with BLLC, and it's rated at 125 watts. Now, to sort of quickly go over a little bit more of what this is, you can see that BLLC, at least whenever it pertains to the Xeon chip, is what Intel calls their local cache integrated into the base tile, meaning this would be a whole bunch of extra cache in one of their tiles on the chip. Once again, very, very similar to what AMD does with 3D fee cache. And the similarities actually don't end there because you can see here that the base tile is a chiplet and a modern Intel CPU package that sits beneath the active tiles. And this is very similar to AMD's approach to their latest X3D CPUs because as they state, the first generation of X3D chips had the V-cache attached to the top of the CPU dies while the newest generation actually flips that and puts it underneath. And this is why AMD's 9000 X3D chips are able to get much higher clocks. Ultimately, it looks Looks like Intel isn't just copying AMD's glue together dies, but they're also trying their hand at X3D.